thank you for joining us this evening for an overview of the new Arthrex Vet Systems OrthoLine Fracture System. My name is Lori Melhorn, Senior Vet Clinical Specialist at Arthrex. Dr. Sean Murphy, Practicing Surgeon at West Vet Animal Hospital in Boise, Idaho, is part of the development team for this new product. And tonight he will be giving us an overview of the system's features and benefits, along with a series of clinical case studies. As a reminder, you are welcome to email your questions to presenter at arthrex.com and one of our development team members will respond by email to any questions received. So at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Murphy to get us started. Okay, thank you very much, Lori, and uh, I'm really excited to present on this. Um, the Arthrex Ortho line has been in the making over several years, um, and really it's this universal plating system, both of currently T plates and straight plates that's been specifically designed uh, for small animals. This wasn't just a human plating system pulled off the shelf. Um, we really tried to put a lot of thought and engineering into it um, to make it specific to our veterinary needs. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was just to provide a disclosure slide to say that I was a consultant for Arthrex Vet Systems, as well as recognize um, Dr. Ian Holsworth and Dr. Chuck Walls. Um, both of them could be giving this presentation right now, and um, they definitely put a ton of work into the development of this system. Um, also, I wanted to really recognize a lot of the other surgeons from across North America and Europe that help to um, look at different plate concepts and um, different prototypes that uh, they then said, hey, this is not really working for us, or we would like this feature. And we try to do this globally so that we got kind of a global take of um, what multiple surgeons wanted um, with features of this plate. I think as veterinarians, we really do face a ton of challenges in small animal fractures. And um, these three dogs right here kind of represent that. Um, we have certainly a very large Malamute who stands about the size of my hip that's going to not necessarily off weight any repair um, because he's so large um, versus this small Yorkie who's going to be quite um, difficult to keep down and is quite rambunctious. Um, overall, we can't overprotect this dog's fracture repair um, for the fear of non-union or stress protection. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the far right is a uh, small dog about six months, or sorry, six weeks old. Um, it's a doodle mix that uh, just has a mid-diaphyseal fracture. Obviously, that dog has massively elastic bones, very thin cortices, and the implant for the Malamute is going to certainly not necessarily match up to that dog. Um, I think really the overall view of um, and, and, and really development and maturity of, of fracture repair, you know, since the 40s when they were really using splints, et cetera, to fix these um, has come along. And it's really paralleled that of the, the human side. Um, in the 60s, obviously, the AO principles um, courses and uh, were sorry, the AO principles were brought to the East Coast in multiple veterinary centers like AMC and the University of Pennsylvania. And really the implants and techniques that were being used on the human side started to kind of trickle into dogs. And AO courses were really started in the 70s to instruct veterinarians, um, collaborate on fracture repair, et cetera, and um, come up with different ideas um, as to how we were gonna, going to treat dogs. And that's obviously developed massively over the years um, and, and certainly numerous surgeons and, and numerous techniques and implants uh, ha have been developed um, during this time. But you really have to give credit to that, that early group who was using nothing but splints. Um, and I, I do you know, always give a shout out to Dr. David Bone, who when I was in high school report, repaired our yeah. Cocker Spaniel uh, for a Y fracture no locking plate, you know, no cannulated screws, no fluoroscopy, probably uh, looked at the implants out of the, or sorry, the radiographs out of the dip tank, and um, that dog did extremely well. So, you know, kudos to, to all of those guys that are, that are out there that, that really helped to lay the foundation for um, veterinary orthopedics. Um, so this is just that eight-week puppy that I showed, and I think, again, this just demonstrates some of that, that difficulty. So, you know, 
this is a relatively elastic bone, thin cortices. It's going to heal fast. Um, and in this case, we kind of did elastic osteosynthesis. We used titanium instead of stainless steel. Um, and this dog actually was twice its uh, size three weeks later. Um, so you're really taking an implant that matches the bone, and then the dog's going to necessarily overgrow that implant. And certainly in young dogs like this, uh, fracture repair is definitely difficult. And so I think material properties are, are going to be very important, and it's been part of the uh, Arthrex Ortho line that we've really tried to define um, and, and utilize to our advantage. And so if you look at the 4.0 and 3.5 broad plate here, um, it's essentially made in stainless steel. The 3.5 narrow, uh, which is the next one, um, is going to be made in uh, in uh, uh, it's here is going to be made in stainless as well. Because we wanted to use titanium, which has a little bit more elasticity for some of the smaller cases, we went to that. Um, and so titanium is the material used um, from our 3 implants here that are going to be a little larger than the 2.7, kind of for maybe um, your typical spaniel breed, like a Brittany spaniel, et cetera, that just is a little smaller than a Labrador and quite can't quite handle a 3.5 plate, but a 2.7 may be a little small. So we try to kind of bridge that gap with the 3.0. And then uh, 2.4 and 2.0 uh, are pretty standard. And then we went with two different 1.6 plates. And we have kind of a 1.6 broad um, that can also hold a 2.0 screw. And then a 1.6 narrow. And that's going to be for um, those toy breed and, and certainly distal extremity fractures. And so that's kind of the overview of that that the line um, that that we've developed. And so just to uh, comment on a few of the design features, the first thing we wanted to do is make a slightly more um, or sorry, slightly lower area for the distal screws um, to engage the cortices. So if you have a small fracture fragment, um, we wanted to get more screws into that fragment. So we decreased the hole-to-hole -hole spacing. And if you look at a standard 3.5 LCP plate and the Arthrex 3.5 plate, it's about a centimeter difference between screw hole four and the tip of the plate. Um, the next thing that we did, and this is going to be in the smaller plates, so this is going to be like a six-hole plate, five-hole plate, and up to eight-hole plate, We've created this central bridge, and really what that central bridge is for is to span uh, transverse or short oblique fractures so that you don't have a screw hole directly over that fracture segment. Um, additionally, that's present uh, in the T-plates, which can be used in like juxta articular applications, again, in those uh, shorter fractures. Um, that central bridge um, is is somewhat helpful again in just keeping that screw away from from the fracture line. Now in the longer plates, so this is going to be nine hole and larger, we kind of did a hybrid between your standard, you know, LCDCP plate and a limb lengthening plate that doesn't have any holes in the center. So we've increased the hole to hole spacing to create less uh, weaknesses through the plate and actually increase the stiffness through the central aspect of the plate. The next features are going to be uh, cortical holes. So this is going to be a slide hole that takes a cortical screw and that allows you to say put the screw in the middle here uh, and this would be screw number one placed in a fracture. And then if you don't like exactly where that plate sits on the bone, it gives you a little wiggle room to move it to the left or to the right um, in this image. So the next hole, and this is going to be on the leading edge of the plate, which has a larger tapered end for MEPO type applications, um, is going to be a standard compression hole. And that's the same compression hole that's found in the TPLO plate. So allowing some compression, obviously, of um, those fractures that allow for it. We've tried to also provide multiple temporary fixation options. So if we're using a K-wire, how do we temporarily affix the plate to the bone? And so we have a K-wire hole seen here on the right. Um, this is a bending plug that can go into the plate that's cannulated and can take a K-wire. 
And then this is uh, Arthrex's BB tack, and it's just a round cylindrical BB like um, projection on a K wire. And that is threaded on the end of that BB, and it allows you to thread the plate. Uh, or sorry, thread the BB tack into the bone and it temporarily affixes that plate. As far as limited contact, um, there's two features with that. So there's undercuts uh, seen here on the plate and then as well as this scallop margin. And that's basically to limit the contact over the periosteum and improve periosteal uh, or decrease periosteal blood supply. Um, interference. The um, T-plate has that as well on uh, the more uh, distal aspect. The cutouts as well as the scalloping also provide some biomechanical advantages in that it decreases the stiffness um, of the plate over those sections um, comparative to the whole. And there's certainly been a lot of engineering and analysis that's gone on so that we don't get one area of the plate that's really stiff with another area of plate that's very weak, which would set up a stress riser and um, is also some of the design feature in those cutouts. Now the universal hole, which I'll refer to as these round holes here, remember this is the slide hole and compression hole seen here, um, can take three different screws in the uh, titanium uh, plates. And the first one is just going to be your standard cortical screw, um, which is seen here in gray. Um, the next is going to be a standard locking screw, which is seen here in pink. And this standard locking screw is going to be inserted with a standard locking lock guide that places that screw perpendicular to the plate. Um, and then finally, in the titanium only version, we have a variable angle locking screw. So this is similar to a polyaxial screw. Um, and the variable angle screw is going to allow one to place this uh, uh, locking screw at multiple angles. And so the way that that works is you're gonna have a conical shaped drill guide here. You freehand drill this, um, with the conical guide giving you some limitation on the amount of variation that you can make uh, along that screw hole. And there's 12 degrees of allowed variation with the guide um, that can be stretched a little bit, but overall 12 degrees um, within any orientation. And so you can see here that this, this is a screw going to the left at 12 degrees and to the right, and they can also come at us or away from us. Um, again, that's uh, only available in the titanium and there is not a variable angle screw option in the stainless. With regards to the stainless steel plates, again, this is going to be the 3.5 and 3.5 broad or 4.0. We've designed a 4.0 screw and the reason for that is that we don't want to have our weakness in the overall construct at the screw bone interface or the screw plate interface. And so by increasing the um, core diameter of this screw, we've massively increased its area moment of inertia and its overall bending strength as well as fatigue uh, strength in, in these cases. So these are relatively large plates. And again, we wanted a screw that was going to uh, equate to the stiffness and uh, biomechanical performance of that plate. With regards to screws in the T-plate, um, there is some mention of screw trajectory that I think is very important. So again, these are going to be used in juxtarticular applications. So if we assume that this is the joint, this red line here, and that uh, joint line is perpendicular to the overall long axis of the plate here, um, the first screw trajectory um, of the screw, let's say one and two in the nose of the plate is going to be 7.5 degrees um, away uh, from that red line. When you look at the plate end on, these screws are going to diverge at two degrees uh, on each side. So that's um, pretty much the entire plate line in an Excel sheet. Um, there's three straight plates in the one six variety. Um, and then there is one T-plate option in the 1.6 variety, and that is a T-plate that has three and then two holes. 
When we move up to all the other T plates, there's both a three hole option, three hole option shown here, as well as a two hole option uh, shown here for one six broad all the way through three five. Um, overall, there's about 10 plates uh, in, in most of 10 straight plates in most of these, uh, ranging from 17 holes to five holes. And the uh, screw lengths are shown here for, for each uh, plate size. Now, over here, you'll see that we have a 4 0 screw. This only works with the 3 5 and 3 5 broad plates. And uh, those screws come in 18 to 16, 65 millimeter. Um, lengths. And then each screw, or sorry, each plate has locking screws uh, with it. And then we also have variable angle locking screws in all of the titanium designs. In the 1.6, the variable angle locking screw and the locking screw are basically the, the same screw type. Um, and then we actually change the screw type to a variable angle or a locking screw in the 2024 and 30. Um, so just uh, moving on now to some of the biomechanics behind this plating system and uh, why we chose what we did. Um, I'm primarily a clinical surgeon. I, I'm not a PhD in biomechanics. And, uh, and so this is my clinical version of, uh, of a biomechanic lecture. So one of the things that I often think about is, you know, how many cycles or steps do we do we see? And while all of us would like our hind limb fracture to uh, walk like this dog afterwards, it's uh, probably not going to happen. And uh, the guys out of um, North Carolina State, um, so this is Dr. Rowe, Dr. Johnson, um, Aper wrote this study that looked at, you know, how many strides per second does a dog take on a force plate, and it's 1.24. Uh, strides per second. And then if you assume that, you know, most dogs following a fracture repair are going to be walked about four times a day for five to 10 minutes, um, you get about 1,500 to 3,000 cycles on a single limb per day. And that translates to about 80 to 170,000 cycles over an eight-week period, which I guess would be standard healing for most fractures that, that we would see in veterinary medicine. So if we just assume that, you know, your standard fracture pending no major pathologic changes is going to be that, we can um, transfer that to an SNN curve, which is basically a curve for any type of material that shows the stress and then the number of cycles for um, that material to fail. And, you know, we have this relatively narrow window. And so if we do something like radiate a bone and uh, we say that, hey, our, our cycles are going to travel way out uh, towards the right of the graph here, then we're going to get fatigue failure. Um, now, one way to decrease stress and have more cycles to failure is certainly to make a bigger implant so that that implant sees less stress. However, um, we know that we're limited in that because we can't stress protect the fracture too much. Um, on the other hand, we can add ancillary fixations such as a plate rod, et cetera, that we'll talk about. So I think one of the uh, studies that really looks at fatigue failure very nicely um, relative to stiffness is uh, Dr. Chow and Dr. Potsy's study. And they really looked at working length and how that uh, affected um, overall stiffness in a cyclic model. And they use that 180,000 cycles um, developed in the North Carolina paper. So they used two different constructs with a 2.4 LCP. Um, working length was long in one construct and relatively short in the other. And really, they, they saw no significant difference in stiffness throughout the cyclic uh, loading of this, this study. Um, and I guess what what I really wanted to uh, take away from the study was not necessarily cyclic fatigue, because um, none of these, these plates failed from cyclic fatigue, but rather how close they were to having a, let's say, plastic uh, deformation of the plate, so some failure of the plate. And so if you look at their full body late, sorry, full body weight, which was 174 newtons as their mean load. That's what they loaded these guys at. 
their failure load after the cycles was only 452 newtons, which equates to about two times the peak vertical force of a trot of these 20 kilo dogs. So that is somewhat concerning, right? So if we have a dog that let's say jumps off the couch that uh, has this implant repair, you know, we're going to probably get somewhere close to that load and have acute failure or a fracture. And in a paper out of ECOT, they saw about a 10 to 12 percent failure rate uh, in dogs with 2.0 and 2.4 plates, um, and those were even with plate rod constructs. So how do we conquer that? You know, how do we reduce that implant uh, failure rate? And I think there's several ways. One is patient factors. So we can limit the dog, put them in a run, limit the load, keep them from jumping off the couch. And that's obviously easier said than done for most of us. Um, surgical factors. We want to do a good job with our repair. We want to, you know, choose the right implants. We want to increase our construct strength as much as we feel that, that we can do. Um, and I think a lot of us will sometimes argue that, you know, was it the patient's fault or was it the surgeon's fault? And I, I think it's important to have that argument with yourself in your head. Um, and this is a uh, case that I did. This is a plate that I removed. Um, this dog had a distal radial fracture fixed, um, went to Mexico, the cast fell off, relatively thin plate um, for that distal radial fracture. And I think it was a, about a 25 kilo um, Staffordshire Terrier. And um, he went on to have deformation of the plate and then an angular limb deformity um, afterwards. Um, so is that my fault? Is it the patient's, you know, patient's fault for, for leaving the splint off? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Maybe I could put a, a slightly larger plate on. Um, and so as we, as we, you know, choose implants and we want to increase our implant strength, we have to remember that, you know, we, that's, that's limited as well. Um, and so if we use a much larger plate, so we select a plate that has um, a larger area moment of inertia. And if you remember back from your biomechanic lectures, that's base height cubed over 12. And so as we increase the height of that plate, we increase its um, biomechanical properties and bending to the third power. Um, and so that's that's great, and we can get massive increases in strength by increasing the height of the implant, and sorry, bending strength by increasing the height of the implant. Um, but we have to remember that that comes with the entire construct. And so this is a dog with a plate rod construct, has a distal femoral plate, um, relatively thick plate, and uh, using a 4-0 cancellous screw with a relatively thin cortical, um, or sorry, cort cortical diameter. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, you can obviously see that this was the weak point of this uh, reconstruction. So just by making a thicker plate, we have to remember that we also match our screw bone and our screw implant interface with that. We know that we can place an implant in a favorable location, so such that that's done with an interlocking nail where we're on the central axis of the bending moment, um, also done obviously with the plate rod concept. And then uh, we can increase load sharing by reconstructing the fracture as well. And um, that uh, that is something that you know we certainly do in our, our carpenter lifestyle, but as we go more into MEPO applications, we may lose a little bit of load sharing um, in the favor of biology. So just some biomechanics of, of current existing plates, and I thought that this was a really nice study. Um, it's actually two studies done um, by Blake and um, Dr. Kovaleski and Dr. Boudreau, um, and this is really a just shows multiple different plate options, their bending stiffnesses um, and, and, and strengths. And I think uh, one of the things that I took away from this was we just take the standard 3.5 LCP, you know, has a bending stiffness of around 38. Um, then we look at an SOP, which is a relatively tall um, plate. It's 40% uh, stiffer than the LCP. But what they went on to do is look at these with the overall uh, when they were placed in a construct, so like a Durlin rod, they've screwed the plates in, um, then putting put them through the materials testing system, and they didn't see any significant increase in stiffness when they were actually looking at the entire construct. So it's important that we that we look certainly at that entire construct. 
The other thing I just wanted to bring up is if we look at titanium, certainly we have less stiffness um, over stainless steel in an LCP uh, model and, um, and less strength as well. So this is, um, I think, a, a nice case that, that exemplifies that. Now, this is not a fair uh, challenge for the SOP. This dog underwent radiation therapy and uh, had a uh, pathologic fracture secondary, very slow healing, um, underwent a plate rod with an SOP. And you can see that it failed at the um, plate screw interface. And um, this is probably a cyclic fatigue failure. Um, I don't know if we can completely blame this on the implant. I think it's more the biology of this of this fracture, but I think it illustrates this relatively large or um, strong implant here versus um, maybe the weaker point being at again that screw interface. Um, so we've gone on to try to you know decrease the overall strain on our repair um, on our plate, and um, Don Holse obviously did a very nice job showing us you know in multiple papers that if we look at different size rods we're going to increase the stiffness of our repair so a rod with about 40 percent canal fill and cortical screws only engaged in the cis cortex in this model showed about a 40 percent increase in stiffness and a decrease in plate strain of about 44 percent and if you remember that s and n curve that i showed so cycles over um over strain of the plate you know that's going to absolutely increase the cyclic fatigue life of your plate. And Don does a very nice job in, in his landmark paper in giving a few examples of how much plate strain um, improve or decreasing plate strain improves your overall cyclic fatigue life. So this is kind of what we shot for in some of our plate design. And we tried to say, OK, well, we want a stiffness of around 50 percent um, of current plates. And because we're going to typically use a plate rod in most uh, fractures that, that we did as a group um, that uh, were non-load sharing or repaired in buttress fashion. And one of the things that we have to remember is that we can't always put in a rod. And so certainly in, in younger dogs, this is an older paper by Withrow and Black, and it showed in 1979 that seven out of eight dogs with an IM pin, now these were relatively large pins, had some alteration of the coxofemoral joint after placing it down the femur. And they saw things like coxobalga and femoral neck shortening, um, reduced femoral head size, as well as subluxation. Um, and I think this is a case that illustrates that. This is a six month old dog that I repaired. Uh, we wanted to be away from a plate rod construct and we used the 3.5 um, Arthrex ortho line plate for that. Um, and knowing that this plate is about as stiff as um, a standard 3.5 with a 30% to 40% rod. So um, some testing was done by Arthrex and um, the overall AMI of a LCP plate is about 13.4. The AMI of the 3.5 standard Arthrex plate is about 22.6. The stiffness is about 1.6 times greater than the 3.5 LCP. And so this was um, basically cantilever bending on a foam block model, and it was really uh, meant to test stiffness of these implants. Now, yield loads were a little weird because as they, it yielded, the foam block yielded as well. And so I wouldn't pay too much attention to this yield load, but despite having this, this uh, increase in stiffness, we would expect the yield load to be higher, uh, which it wasn't. So I think before we go and uh, just pull out all our plate rod constructs and say Sean said that, you know, this plate is just as stiff as a plate rod, um, we need to do some additional testing there. Um, for a 3.5 broad Arthrex plate compared to a 3.5 broad LCP, uh, the AMIs are listed here, and then the stiffness is just about 1.4 to 1.5 times um, increased in the Arthrex plate. Um, as far as the stainless steel plates go, I'm sorry, as far as the titanium plates go, we really wanted to kind of use titanium to our advantage, okay? And titanium, remember, has a lower Young's modulus than stainless steel. So if you look at a stress strain curve here, the slope for titanium is going to be less than the slope for stainless steel, i.e. it's less stiff. But the yield strength is higher for titanium 6.4 than it is for stainless steel. 
So if we match, you know, this um, stress strain curve and we say, okay, well, we're going to make an implant and let's just say it's a 2-4 plate and we're going to match this stiffness by increasing the overall size of that plate, then we're going to massively increase our yield strength. Okay, and so that's basically um, what we were able to do and, and, and show in this. And again, um, this test was set up for stiffness. I've listed yield load over here as well. Um, but what I'd really like to say is be careful of these yield loads because they don't quite mathematically uh, work out. And we have some further testing, I think, to do on that. With regards to stiffness, however, um, we compared the Arthrex plates uh, relative to standard stainless LCPs. And so if you look at the 1.6 Arthrex plate and we compare that to a 1.5 LCP, it's about 0.8 times as stiff. So about 80% as stiff as a 1.5 LCP, but its yield load increases by about 300%. Um, and again, that's just material properties. Um, 1.6 broad Arthrex plate relative to a 1.5 slash 2 LCP thin increases the yield load about 140% and is just a little less stiff than our uh, smaller LCPs. And again, that's because we're using titanium. And so this is something that we really wanted, right? We, we If we're going to have a toy breed dog with, let's say, a distal radial fracture, we want to have some give because we don't want to stress protect this. But when that toy breed dog jumps off the couch, we're hopeful that the plate doesn't break. Um, and so then moving up and, uh, and, and really, I guess, kind of moving up the line as we know that we started to increase our stiffnesses with 2.0 and 2.4 plates. So we felt like, you know, we really want to have a stronger plate in the 2.0 and 2.4 variety than what we typically see um, with, with standard stainless plates. And so we increased our stiffness there and that increased the yield load by about 200%. And then uh, with the 3.0 plate, we really wanted something that was almost twice as stiff as a 2.7 LCP. This plate was going to see a lot um, and uh, its yield load increased by about 300%. Um, and we were just about 1.9 times as stiff as an LCP. So hopefully, if you're using LCPs right now, this gives you a little bit of an idea um, in terms of a chart to guide your stiffness. Just again, be care a little bit careful of the yield loads, and I think we have some further testing to do there. Now, one of the other concerns that we have is a, a fracture gap model, right? So if we take um, it, sorry, not a fracture gap model, but if we take yeah, as, as a hybrid screw. So if we're taking locking screws and we are saying that instead of putting in three locking screws here, we're going to actually hybridize that with a non-locking screw, what are the effects on that overall construct? And so there's been a fairly nice paper, paper done by Gardner where they used three locking screws and then had a fracture gap model additional three locking screws. Um, they compared that to two locking screws with a cortical screw and then repeated that on the other side of the fracture gap and they saw no difference in construct stiffness during cyclic loading. Um, the folks at Wisconsin, Roe Guthrie, as well as Jason Bleedhorn did also a nice study looking at five different hybrid constructs and they saw, they saw that the hybrid uh, constructs had similar strength and stiffness to fully locked constructs. And one thing they did find is that having a locking screw adjacent to the fracture gave you significantly stiffer bending and torsion. So along those lines of just biomechanics, now I'd just like to, to take that and then move on to just, you know, how we apply these and, and then again, how they uh, kind of integrate across current plating systems that Arthrex has. Um, so certainly there's multiple temporary fixation options, and that's going to be our first step in any application of the plate to the bone. And we can use a K-wire um, or a BB tack to to uh, fixate the plate to the bone. We can also just go straight to the slide hole um, and uh, um, that's actually gonna be on the other side of the plate, however, because in this illustration, this is the large leading edge and this is going to be the compression hole. Um, and then that slide hole again, allows us to have a little bit of movement with that, with that plate. 
Um, so again, just showing maybe placement of a plate in, let's say, a short oblique fracture, and let's say we put our BB tack in here, then we've gone ahead and drilled our uh, slide hole. As we pull our BB tack out and put our slide hole screw in, we notice that yeah, our fracture is going to be a little close to this hole uh, right here. So that slide hole allows us to move the plate uh, let's just say distally or to the right a little bit um, before we then go on to drill this hole. Now, application principles are going to be similar to those currently done um, with locking plate systems. And so Stoffel wrote one of the um, original kind of landmark articles on this. And so we want to try to have that plate screw density of around less than 0.5. So in this illustration here, our screw density is 0.46 in that there are six screws placed over a 13 hole plate in this span. Um, spanning the bone by about 80% um, will increase the working length of that plate and um, help out the overall biomechanical um, performance. Um, the uh, next thing is that by lowering the working length, um, we can increase the overall stiffness of the plate and decrease the strain in the plate. Okay, and so this gets a little bit confusing um, on some more recent data versus Stoffel's data. So if we lower the working length, meaning that we put our screws closer to the fracture site, then in a plate, or sorry, in a fracture gap model that's six millimeters, we are going to decrease plate strain and you know increase stiffness to some degree in that repair. So if you're using this as a buttress plate and you've got greater than a six millimeter gap here, certainly placing the plate, or sorry, placing the screw closest to the fracture line is going to be most helpful. Now, Stoffel showed that in a less than one millimeter gap, it was beneficial to leave two to three screws, screws open over that gap to decrease plate strain. Now, that's been seen differently in several other articles, um, and this is the most recent publication by Bird, where they saw that lowering the working length actually decreased plate strain and increased stiffness in a compressed transverse fracture model. Okay, so I think. There's two camps on this. Bird does a very nice job in their discussion if you want to read some of those points. Um, but I think current recommendations would be to both in a fracture gap model as well as a compressed fracture is uh, to place that screw closest to your fracture line. Now, the other thing that we need to remember is that if we have a screw hole open right over the fracture gap, we want to try to avoid that based on uh, the Allen study um, that was on a 1.5 LCP, where they looked at placement of that screw hole over the fracture gap, just very versus just mild shifting of the plate, so that the plate, so that the screw hole was not over that. Um, again, plate length should be 80%, three times the length of the comminuted fracture, and then. When placing screws, you know, at least two bicortical screws in uh, most fracture repairs. And then if you're using a bridging plate, you know, probably you want to go with three to four screws. Now, three screws increases bending strength relative to two. Four does very little to improve bending strength, but it does improve torsion. Um, and then the bone plate interface, we want to hold that bone within or sorry, hold that plate within two millimeters of the bone. So you don't want the plate greater than that. Um, that's based on Stoffel's study, and uh, as well as, again, avoiding that hold over the fracture site. Now, in a hybrid system, so in the Arthrex plate here, because we have a cortical screw, if you want to have a true you know, locking construct and not a hybrid construct, then you can certainly leave this screw hole open and place another uh, locking screw down here, um, which would still be outside of the fracture gap in this model. Now, 
just a little bit of information on the compression and the slide holes. So in particular, the compression hole on the Arthrex TPLO plate is going to be you know, somewhat more aggressive than that of a typical uh, round hole or oval hole on a DCP plate. So if you look at the drill guide being placed in full compression, okay, so all the way over to this side of the plate, the screw, or sorry, the hole's then drilled, and then the screw is going to slide down this ramp. With 100% compression, you're going to have approximately three millimeters of movement of that screw when you're drilled in 100% compression. Okay, so if you have a fracture that's, let's say, transverse, and you have it pretty well put together. If you compress that in full compression, you might get some tipping of the fracture like this, um, because again, that's a relatively aggressive compression hole. And so it's nice in it, it, that if we have a gap, we can really compress that gap if, uh, if we need to, um, but you also need to use it cautiously. And so if you go to 50% compression, so you drill uh, your initial pilot hole at the center of this oval hole, then rather than moving about three millimeters in a three five plate, you're going to move about a millimeter and a quarter. Okay. And so this is the amount of movement that you're going to see for each plate size at both 50% compression and 100% compression. Um, and I think this is one thing that's a little bit diff different in the application of this plate. Now with variable angle screws, again, we have this conical shaped drill guide. It's gonna sit right in the nose of this plate, and then that's gonna keep you in that 12 degree span that we talked about. And again, allow you to have that 12 degree variation of screw angle. So as far as plate and screw options specifically, um, what I wanted to discuss is that the 1.6 and 2.0 plates have the same locking, same size locking mechanism. And so the 2.0 plate will accept a 1.6 screw, okay? And vice versa, the 1.6 broad will, will also accept a 2.0 screw. The 1.6 thin will accept a 2.0 screw, although this is such a small plate, I'm not sure you ne necessarily wanna go there. For the two four plates, um, you're going to have uh, just two four screws that are accepted, both cortical variable angle locking and locking. And then for the three O plate, very similar uh, screw choices. Now for the two four plate, you can, let's say you strip a two four cortical screw, you can bump up to a three O cortical screw. Um, those will be interchangeable. And then on the 3.5 side, um, the 3.5 narrow plate, as well as the 3.5 broad plate can take both a cortical 3.5 screw, as well as a 3.5 locking screw or a 4.0 locking screw. As far as integration with TPLO, and this was uh, important to us because we don't wanna have a million implant systems floating around the clinic and a million different screw types. Um, and, uh, um, this was actually, I think, is going to be really helpful from an inventory management side. So the TPLO with the 3.5 and the 3.5 broad, you can use the same universal drill guide, same K-wire, same locking drill guide, same screwdriver depth gauge, pretty much completely interchangeable. Um, you can also use a 4.0 locking screw and, and I would say potentially in the 3.5 broad TPLO plate. Now, Arthrex has not done testing on this yet, but um, that will be hopefully a, a option for the future. As far as integration with the smaller plates, so for the 2.0 and the 2.4, it's very similar. So the K-wire holes are the same, the locking drill guides are the same, the depth gauges are the same, and we can use locking and cortical screws. We have not tested variable angle locking screws in this um, construct. Uh, screwdrivers are also the same. The 1.6, again, will integrate with 2.0 screws, although in a TPLO, I'm not sure why you would necessarily do this. Um, there's not a 1.6 TPLO plate. 
Um, as far as the 3 screws, now remember that's this fuchsia colored plate here. That is not interchangeable with the 27 TPLO plate because the 27 TPLO plate is made in stainless steel. However, the screwdriver and the depth gauge are the same. So hopefully that helps you out um, to know some of that, that integration. So finally, I just wanted to kind of close with a few clinical applications um, of these plates being applied to uh, true clinical cases. And so this was our first case here. Um, this is a five-year-old mini Aussie with a distal radius ulna fracture um, who ran into a car going about 30 miles an hour. Um, so pretty standard distal radius ulna fracture. Um, we had had the first set of plates come out, and as I laid them on the table, I couldn't help thinking later that it looked like the shape of Idaho. So I thought, okay, well, this is going to be perfect. Uh, we're in Idaho. We're going to fix this. Um, some, something must be aligning here. Um, so we talked to these owners, um, got consent to use a, a new plate, and um, thanks to Penny's owners in this case, um, who allowed us to, to do that. Um, and this is just that radius ulna fracture repaired intraoperatively. Um, adductor pollicis longus is just here. And uh, you can see that we put the plate in with three locking screws and a single cortical screw on each side. Um, Penny's a little bit of a heavier dog. And so we just wanted to make sure that we um, had plenty of, of implant in this case. Um, this was also just a slightly open fracture, um, a lot of swelling as well. Um, so there's the post-operative repair and the lateral and the AP view. And then this is at six weeks of healing. We still have some healing to go on the ulna, obviously, but early healing across the, the radius. Um, and Penny's now gone on to do quite well. Um, the next screw is a femoral fracture in six months, or sorry, next screw, next case is a femoral fracture in a uh, six month old Doberman weighing about 20. 8.1 kilos. Um, this dog went on to gain uh, about five kilos uh, when it came back in for x-rays at eight months, which I thought was interesting. Um, so this dog was injured in the backyard, had a relatively proximal um, spiral fracture um, that, uh, that went up and into the proximal femoral metaphysis. Um, so relatively easy fracture to reconstruct via an open lateral approach. Um, we did not use a plate rod in this case for fear, again, of, of um, changing femoral neck geometry and femoral growth later on. Um, you can see that this one screw gets pretty close to the growth plate, but doesn't necessarily penetrate it. Um, so this dog went on to uh, heal relatively well. So here's uh, early callus formation at four weeks and then just some remodeling of that fracture at the nine week time point um, at which the dog was taken back to full activity. Um, there was a avulsion of the adductor and so we got a lot of periosteal reaction um, over that insertion. Um, and that's then starting to remodel over time at the nine week radiograph seen on the lateral view. Um, next case was a very interesting one. This is a five month old 30 kilo Newfoundland um, who was hit by an ATV on a farm. Um, sustained a scapular neck fracture. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting approach if you haven't done it. There's a nice uh, article out of uh, Ireland that actually describes a craniolateral approach for this in DCOT. Um, and it's a muscle separation between the deltoid and the supraspinatus kind of distally here. And then you take down the omotransversarius across the sca scapular spine here. Um, I think they had like eight cases in, in that report and um, it's certainly a nice read if you ever have to do one of these. So as you get closer down and just a magnified image, um, remember that the suprascapular nerve comes right across that neck and it's seen here. Um, and so this is, we used a 3.5, uh, three hole Arthrex T plate for this uh, fracture. Um, the plate's nice because it's relatively low profile, um, particularly when you have this nerve coming across it. Um, so there's the uh, post-operative repair um, from the AP and lateral view, and then just some follow-up x-rays of the original image 
uh, post-operative reconstruction, and then early callus formation and healing at three and a half weeks. Um, this dog had been in the canal, I think, three to four times swimming with its spica splint on, um, so we took it out of the spica at, at that three and a half week mark. Um, this is um, just the lateral views showing early fracture healing at that three and a half week mark, as well as uh, placement of, of the uh, plate. Um, next is just another utilization of a T plate. So this is a one-year-old domestic short hair, unknown history of trauma. It's also FIV positive with uh, upper ear respiratory infection. Um, this cat sustained a ileal body fracture. This is just the post-operative repair with again that three-hole T plate, um, kind of matched up nicely to the coxofemoral joint here and allowed us uh, three screws on the uh, caudal fragment. This um, cat also had a distal physeal fracture as well that was repaired with a cross pin technique. And then uh, at four and a half weeks, we've got early callus formation, early healing, and uh, this cat was allowed to go back to activity at eight weeks. Um, just another proximal femoral fracture. This one was uh, repaired actually in a six month old Labrador by one of the other surgeons in our clinic um, who called me and said, hey, can I use this, uh, this Arthrex plate? It's the only one that'll fit for, for this uh, fracture. And I said, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, so this uh, again, kind of took advantage of that relatively narrow screw profile. Um, she actually wanted a longer plate for this to get a, a little bit more um, plate spanning over the fracture, but uh, we didn't unfortunately have that plate. I think I'd already used it on the Doberman. Um, and so uh, there's the post-operative repair, and you saw again how, how proximal that fracture was. Um, the surgeon chose not to go over the, uh, sorry about that, chose uh, not to go over the trochanter apophysis in this case, um, just because of this dog being young and, and still having some trochanter growth. Um, so this is, uh, radiographs at, I believe this is six weeks, just showing that uh, callus formation, bridging certainly on the lateral view, and uh, no major shifting of the implants. Um, and then one of the other surgeons uh, in the practice uh, repaired this. This is a, an Idaho shag dog. We do have our own uh, dog breed in Idaho. It's a herding dog, uh, works on farms a lot. So this dog uh, had gone out and eaten a chicken, um, had some unknown trauma, and then came home non-weight bearing um, after its feast. Um, this uh, had an open fracture actually, and uh, relatively transverse with a small fragment over the lateral aspect. Um, so did an open repair in this. Um, it was just too hard to get back together uh, with Meepo. Uh, and so um, basically just a standard open medial approach to the tibia. And um, there's the uh, post-operative images. And uh, so far this dog's gone on to, to heal quite well. So kind of in summary, um, after those, those clinical cases, um, I just wanted to, you know, first bring up that I think our clinical case numbers are relatively low right now, and certainly time will produce more clinical cases um, to see if we have any, any holes in these plates. Um, I think you think that a Rectangle of steel with holes in it is a pretty simple thing, um, but uh, I've certainly been very impressed by the amount of engineering that goes into that little rectangular piece of steel. Um, we know that biomechanical testing as well um, is pretty much in its infancy, and um, based on those results I gave you, I'd just like you to take care um, in exercising those in clinical application, i.e. just applying the plate without a standard plate rod, if uh, that's something that you typically do. Um, the hope is that the improvement in some of these designs, the improvement in sizing options and biomechanical properties may ease applications and uh, improve healing as well as lim limit, you know, overall complications. Um, and I think the other uh, major thing that we wanted to get after here is that we could integrate, you know, these screws, these um, surgical um, implants with other existing specialty plates uh, throughout the hospital to kind of lower in inventories 
and also to make it so that we don't have to have you know five different screws to put in put in you know five different types of plating system and i think that's been done uh very well um and then, you know, finally, I just wanted to really thank Arthrex um, for taking on this project. Um, I thought it was going to be very easy. It obviously wasn't and has uh, involved multiple engineers from all over the globe who've done a tremendous amount of work on this, um, as well as the clinical staff, um, such as Lori and, and, and Matt Hubre, that have done uh, a ton of work on this. And then just again to mention Dr. Ian Holsworth and Dr. Chuck Walls, they've been a huge part of this, um, this project and, and um, as well as multiple other surgeons, again, from across the globe telling us, hey, this is where, you know, I think I would see things differently. The bottom line is, is you'll never have a perfect plate that'll meet everybody's needs, but I think we're getting, you know, somewhat close to it with, with this design. And I think I'm, I'm obviously biased as a, as you know, one of the consultants on this plate, um, and and I think that this Mark Twain quote was great. And it's really not what you don't know that gets you into trouble; it's uh, what you think you know for sure, but just isn't true. Um, and so, you know, with that quote, uh, certainly again, we're in our infancy, but I, I'm very hopeful that that uh, this plate will will go on to um, hopefully help you out in some of your clinical cases. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lori. And um, f- feel free to, again, email us with any questions to presenter at arthrex.com. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Murphy. That was fabulous. It was a wonderful uh, overview, um, mechanical studies, and uh, your clinical experience also. So we're very thankful for that.